thank you so much for the great introduction. Uh, wow, this is an amazing room, by the way. Uh, so when I entered the place, I was like, whoa, this is very cool. Like a lot of transparent walls, stairs, and so on. So very geeky place uh, the conference is happening in. Uh, yeah. As, as we already know, my name is Paula J. I got a pretty complex last name. <laughs> Uh, but, but of course, as, as uh, you could hear, it's Januszkiewicz, and uh, I'm from Poland, but I do travel a lot indeed. Uh, but uh, at the end, uh, it doesn't really matter, I would say, because IT in the current world, it's, it has no borders, and uh, this is really what we're going to be also talking about within our keynote. So as you see, a very short intro. I'm the CEO of Secure. I established the company uh, 10 years ago, literally 10 years ago, because literally in two weeks we are uh, celebrating our 10 years. So this is this is the background, and uh, this is pretty much the time I've been in cybersecurity plus additional four years when I was growing myself into that subject. And right now our team it's 38 people. Uh, which is quite surprising for me as well, because nobody in IT teaches you how to do business. And I'm like facing this C whatever role, which is kind of funny. I'm a penetration tester, and uh, this is what I grew on at. And uh, at the end, uh, someone or life put me in the role of being a C person in a company, uh, which I'm always trying to like give my tasks to someone else. And I still like to be in consulting, uh, visiting customers pretty much all around the world. So we are in New York, Dubai, uh, Switzerland and Poland, and uh, it sounds very like big, but all these offices are really small. Besides the one in Poland, uh, in Warsaw, so basically when you're going to be there, uh, jump in for a coffee or something because we are very welcoming uh, to everybody, really, because our our team is very like happy people. Anyway, uh, <laughs> you will see that in general when you come over, uh, but. Um, what, what, what's the background? The background is that um, I do, of course, that cybersecurity part. Uh, I like to share knowledge at the various conferences as well, including Black Hat and so on. But for us, as a whole team, it's always a great opportunity to say whatever it's new in cybersecurity, whatever it's up to date, etc. Uh, and the reason why we're doing it is because there is a big need of cybersecurity specialists in the market, and um, there's a lot of different types of situations at our customer sides that require attention. That's why that keynote is titled Think and Act Like a Hacker, so that we look at the infrastructure, at the solutions that you guys play with, and so on, from the hacker's perspective. Because it's a keynote, in general, the keynotes have that in common that they are not very technical, but my keynote is going to be actually quite technical. I've heard that you are a bit of a hardcore uh, IT people out there, so this was my instruction that we're going to actually make it technical, so hopefully you don't mind. Uh, I don't mind, for sure. It's even better for me. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so let's do it this way. And uh, let's start with something soft, and then we're going to cover everything with good examples. So starting with something soft. Uh, basically, there are two statistics that I would like to share with you. One is given by Financial Times, and Financial Times said uh, that by 2019, so literally around the corner, we're going to be in the need of 6 million cybersecurity professionals, but with the current development and building our skill set, we will build from 4 to 5 million. And that's quite sad, because we are indeed 1.5 million soldiers short, and that means two things. That depends really from which perspective you look at this. Yeah? So one perspective could be, you are a cybersecurity consultant, that's good for you, because then it means that you're going to be needed in the market and for sure we even in our team we don't have a salesperson like it's literally this way cybersecurity is in need and uh, to, to get the projects in cybersecurity is not very difficult because there is a big need for that for skill set for good knowledge for good quality etc while if you are the one that is in a position of hiring someone and I'm kind of in that position too then we are struggling with finding good specialists yeah so this is like a road through hell so we really want that to change, but that is something that requires our time and attention for knowledge. Now, the good news is that by 2021, and this is something that is by Cybersecurity Ventures, uh, followed by Forbes, it's actually Forbes that put that in a quote, uh, they say that by 2021, we're going to need 3.5 million cybersecurity, we're going we're gonna to have uh, job openings. That means that uh, that will be also a need out there from the market to get us in into interesting jobs in cybersecurity. That's why investing in it makes lots of sense. And I've been doing this for the past 10 years. And basically, we can see an amazing growth in our customer awareness in basically skill set of people. So someone who was working in IT, 
there is this infusion with security as well happening in the companies. So this is a good news for us. So it, in general, it's worth to know more. And this is my point. So whenever, of course, we are thinking about that subject, just a couple of words and stories related with the security awareness in the organization. Because uh, awareness, behavior and culture are these three things that are absolutely important within the organization, but not everybody kind of knows how to define it. So let me give you an example before we start, a little bit of a story uh, of a cybersecurity situation where uh, I was in a position of getting into the customer side. So if you know me a little bit better, you will see that I'm actually quite... Uh, well, how to say it, open, very strict as well, very ironic, and I like uh, this hardcore sense of humor. So uh, forgive me if we're going to get someone s at some point in this presentation in that area. But um, what's the story? Uh, let me just show you the story, you will see what I mean. So basically, I was supposed to do the social engineering pen test for one of our customers actually in Switzerland. And um, I'm usually doing this pen test because I'm a female. I mean, look around you. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. That's a <laughs> that works. I mean, I'm sorry. It works. Yeah. So uh, I'm blonde. That also kind of like putting that in a stereotype works. I mean, not everybody likes blondes, but yeah, it's okay for me. I mean, I don't complain. So um, this is the this is the story. And uh, my job was to get access to the customer infrastructure. So I'm like on a street level, and uh, there is like a door, and there is like the company. It's announced on the eighth floor, but I know that that company spreads across the sixth, seven, and eighth floor. Yeah, so I don't want to get to the eighth floor because there is a receptionist most probably sitting, and I don't want to like you know her to see me or whatever. So um, I need to figure out the way how to get access to. And we all do it all the time. Yes, yeah? so we do things like tailgating, etc. And this is exactly what I did. So there was another option to get access to, besides just calling them and there's this big camera. So I could use the cart and I could do the tit and then the door opens, or I could use the pin and then the door opens. Yeah, so this kind of like door. So what I did, there's like some nice guys <laughs> getting into the building, uh, into the elevator area. So I literally stick into their backs and uh, they like turn around. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, sorry. So when you smile, they smile back. It's all fine, a little flirt. Uh, so, you know, and uh, I'm saying, that story to you as it's really happening over there because this is kind of a me doing this yeah so at the end like they whatever get into their floors and i'm that in that elevator area and there's an elevator a and b and there is a path in in between and you can say which i mean you can push which floor you want to go to yeah so i really need to get with someone to that elevator so what i'm doing and i'm leveraging it's a again a little bit of a female stereotype of us having big bags with like, you know, three mobile phones, keys to whatever garage, garage of our neighbors and stuff, yeah? So that kind of like, I cannot find my cart. Oh my God, where is it amongst all this whatever screwdriver? So I'm like looking for that. And uh, there is this nice guy coming and he's pressing the floor number six. Don't get me wrong, he was really nice. I got a husband, but who cares? Yes, because <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> it's really my job, yeah, out there. So, I mean, yeah. You know what I mean? So basically, um, the elevator door opens, and what I'm doing, I'm jumping immediately to the backside of the elevator. And the question to you is, why did I do that? Why to the backside of the elevator? What do you think, guys? Come on, come on, don't hesitate. <laughs> what do, what, like, put yourself in this situation. What did I want to achieve? To be the last to get out, good point. Some other ideas, it's a very good point. I don't have to press the buttons. The, the truth is that the buttons were outside, yeah? If they were inside, then that would be a case, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To get the best overview. To get the best overview, very good point. I could, I could see what's happening, right? Like in that elevator, as well, I could uh, maybe hide behind this guy's back and so, and so on. So, absolutely, so, so you got the situation, right? Now, the thing is that when we get to the elevator, there is this chat that's beginning. I'm a big fan of micro expressions, so I'm really looking forward to see like, how people react to different types of situations that I could cause. So once we get to the elevator, I'm talking to this guy and I'm like, hi, how are you? And he's like, oh, good, how are you doing? I'm like, I'm well, nice to see you again. Yeah, so. <laughs> So the, so the again word, um, whenever you, we think, of course, about social engineering part, it's almost like putting you in a not comfortable situation because he does not remember me, but like I'm saying again, so he feels obliged to react. And that's good. I could see that by his face. He's like, oh, nice to see you again. I'm like, 
you're such a liar. Of course, I didn't say that, but <laughs> seriously, how could he say that he's the first time he's seeing me? But again, I mean, seriously, so I'm like, hey, nice perfumes, yeah? And he's like, oh, you think so? I'm like, yeah, I think so. And we got to the sixth floor. The temperature is hot in the elevator. The door is opening, yes. His ego is pumped. He's lowered, he's low, he literally lowered his voice. So all the things that I'm going to check, 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 right? And then basically he takes his card, He's like, he gets out of the elevator, he does the peek, he opens the door, and he says with a lowered voice, ladies first, yeah? So, I'm, <laughs> so this is really like the situation out there. So cybersecurity is not really technology, right? And uh, we do have technologies that are allowing us to uh, fight different types of situations, but that is the situation that clearly shows that we as humans are vulnerable to this kind of situations. Now, question would be, is the technology implemented on site allowing or disallowing me to steal information. Because what I did, we just say bye-bye, and then I literally sat at the trader's desk, because it's a financial company. So when the traders finish their whatever million dollar contracts or whatever, then, uh, or transactions, then they literally stood up and they went out for lunch. And their company said, because it was within a policy, that, hey, we do care about your cybersecurity because we lock your desktop after inactivity after five minutes. That's a quite a nice time, so I feel safe and comfortable that when I'm going to stand up and make myself a coffee somewhere out there, my desktop is going to be locked. Actually, five minutes is quite a long time. So I used that window to actually sit at one of the guy's desks, and I was literally sitting there for a moment, copied whatever I was supposed to copy. So technically, information theft is jumping into the field. And then the second part, I was like, come on, it can be that easy. Sincerely, within that time, I was doing the social engineering tests, and I'm doing this for all my professional life. Um, I've been only stopped once. I will tell you an interesting story later on as well, but within that situation, I was literally sitting there, I copied, and then I was like, yoing. I was like, Whoa. and I was like, provoking situation. People were like, what, like checking, what is she doing? Like, but nobody really asked me any kind of question. I literally started to poke people. I was like, hey, you, hi, out there, hey, hey. Yes, and uh, then ba basically they were like, oh, oh, I'm like, hi, hi there. And they were like, hi, and then no questions at all. So I, I made myself like an idiot over there, but still nobody really did anything, yeah? So this is the case. Um, my pre two, two, two weeks ago, I was doing the pen test, uh, which was a technical combined with social engineering. And this, this was probably my weirdest pen test in this life that I um, <laughs> happened to do, because I was doing the pen test of a uh, furniture warehouse. And my job, that was a customer order, was supposed to, to take something. And I'm like, it's a furniture warehouse. What am I supposed to take out? Like, closet? <laughs> yes, <Yeah>, seriously. <laughs> so, so I took a carpet, because this was actually the, <laughs> the lightest thing I could, I could literally work on. So there's this security guard. Again, another story that I had a chance to talk with. And he's like, what are you doing here? Who are you? I'm like, oh, don't bother my pass, because I've been granted a pass last week, and I've been here over weekend. And I came with an iPad. I'm like, and I'm doing audit of what you guys have in a warehouse. You know, like company wants to optimize things. And he's like, oh, great, optimize. So yeah, definitely jump in. And I took a carpet, and I literally, I was like, OK, let, how ironic can you be? I took it and I was like literally like this, yeah, with the carpet, waved to the guy, he waved to me, smile and goodbye, yeah. So uh <laughs> So part of the part of the <laughs> security on there, yeah. So 87% of the companies that have been breached, they didn't have a security awareness education program in place. And that says statistic also shows one thing that not always our employees understand what's going on. Yes, it's our job really to be good at technology and they need to know um, the basic principles of what to do. So just to sum up with the analogy, uh, before we get into the technical part, awareness comes with experience, and of course, behavior comes with awareness. We know what to do, we know what, what can happen, so we act. Yeah? But at the end, the culture comes with understanding. So this is just an example that 14.4 incidents per year, they're happening just because someone loses the data. Yeah, so we've got pen drives, etc. We lose this information, and then that's becoming a problem. Now, the funny part is that it used to be a problem some years ago, then it went through a silence mode. Now, for example, Microsoft is talking about it where we've got Azure information protection where you can classify certain information and only target it to a certain type of people. So when we lose it, it's okay, yes, because nobody will be able to open it. Question is, do we have solutions like that in place? Because this is a bit of a trend right now. So before we move forward, 
we need to discuss, of course, seven security issues that should not happen in upcoming 2019. So it looks to, like it's going to be quite an important year if it's about the security awareness. And there's a couple of things that I would like to spread. Now, some of them, they sound easy, but they do have a lot of interesting technology coverage, co coverage uh, underneath. And let's start with this. So basically, um, whenever we are thinking about pathetic passwords, what do we mean? We're not really thinking about people using passwords because it's a kind of a cliche. We already know that we've got by Microsoft this password less thing um, and so on. So yeah, the passwords in general co conceptually are bad. But it's not really about this. It's about passwords being reused in various technologies. And this is what I would like to start with. So let's start with a little bit of a demonstration because I would like to show you uh, situations that are happening in the operating systems that are making us to be able to get the passwords out. And that has been always like that in Microsoft. Uh, that isn't fixed. There are solutions that can help to fix it, which we're going to mention. But effectively, this is something that is out there and has always been there. Yeah? So yes, for that particular situation, you need to be privileged. We are not really talking about what hacker can do to us from the outside, being completely a foreigner. But we're going to, of course, get that scenario that as well. But we are talking about uh, who can log on to our server and who can extract certain type of information. And it, should this information be, of course, over here. So let's get into the toolkit. First of all, what I will do, uh, I will uh, leverage myself uh, uh, or elevate myself into uh, the local system, not this one really, but exe, here we go. And we are here, uh, local system. Now, what are we going to get? We're going to get the configuration of the service. Now, th which one? Here, this one. Yeah, so I've got a very important service running as Freddy. Yeah? And uh, that particular situation means that if system, so services.exe eventually, is able to get whatever it's out there tape, typed in, and start the certain type of a process yeah, with these particular credentials, then these credentials must be saved somewhere. Now, whenever we look deeply into that whole process, maybe it's not very romantic, but eventually what the situation is that in order to log someone on, I need to, of course, confirm the username and the password. And we verify that against something. So it could be some database, it could be a domain, entities.did, doesn't matter. But the second stage of a logon however simple that sounds, it's actually a creation of a token. So after the logon, these two processes are independent. So the token cre creation can happen even if I'm not logged on. Because we can talk to local security authority subsystem and say, hey, create me a token of whatever from domain whatever. Can we do that? Yes, and we're going to have a process running at that, as that particular user from the domain that is not existing because it's just a token. Yeah? So here, though, in order for that user to be able to communicate with the domain um, services, we need to have that password stored somewhere. And there are over 20 places like this in the operating system where we can actually extract the password from the configuration. Now, where is this? Well, let's have a look. First of all, if we do have a look uh, into registry, that stuff is actually placed in policy. Very nice folder called secrets. Uh, <laughs> Which is quite ironic, I would say, because I mean, obviously, nobody wants to get there. Yeah. Um, so there, there's the name of the service. A very important service has this shortcut in my registry, TENASRV, and over here there is this current value, which represents us symmetrically encrypted password of that account. Now, question is, how can we decrypt it? Well, answer is very straightforward. It's nice to have a tool. I will show you basically a couple of other examples that are needed here. And for that reason, we're going to get into tools. Here we go. And we're going to get into uh, CQ secrets dumper. And we're going to specify the service. And within that service, we specify TENA SRV, like this. And then, of course, the password comes out. Now, what's the mitigation for that? Is it good, bad? Well, obviously, password is out there. Mitigation for that, of course, it's a group managed service account, which, by the way, in Windows Server 2019 has been improved a little bit. And uh, they are improved to have a little bit uh, better authentication within the network. But once we create that kind of stuff in a PowerShell, then uh, that password is gone. Is it really gone? That's a bit of a problem. Yeah. So let me show you something. So what we're going to do is we're going to get the service. And I got here the account that is already working, WAW. And I'm going to use this account over here. So I'm going to do log on, bros. And then I'm going to do WAW. Here we go. I got two of them. 
let's choose this one, fine. Yes, so this is a typical situation for the group managed service account. This account has a dollar at the end, uh, so which is a characteristic for that type of an account. It will not uh, take place uh, until we start and stop the service. Uh, that's basically uh, not true because that value is already saved in the registry. So we change that for the very important service. I mean, we can really restart it. It doesn't really, really matter at that point, but just to show you. And we've got this WAW, and now once we get into that setting here, yeah, we get into TNA SRV and the password is still there. Don't forget that. Microsoft doesn't really talk about it. Yeah, uh, what's the problem? The problem is that if we get into the registry after you change the account to the GMSA, that secret is not cleared. Yeah, so that's what we call a pathetic password because it's still there. So what do we need to do? Literally this, delete, which kind of sounds awkward in the automated world that we are living in, that you actually have to go there and delete that. Yeah. So we've got various customers that did the hardening of their infrastructure, yeah, and they changed the service account into GMSAs wherever they could, but then they forgotten to, to actually delete the values from the registry. So when we do pen tests, one of the things, and that's a hacker's perspective that we check, I'm like, oh, group managed service account, lovely. There is probably some trash in the registry, let's check it out. So we check it out. And there is indeed a trash in the registry. Maybe that password is reused somewhere. So I'm collecting these passwords during pen tests into my passwords database that I'm going to run across anything I see. Yeah, so that I can check out later that maybe this guy or girl were actually reusing the passwords in the infrastructure. So this is a little bit of a situation. Yeah? Now, uh, whenever we are thinking, of course, about that passwords being reused, yeah, let's get into another example. So. In the operating system, we've got systems data protection API. And we're going to be getting into that. It's, that's probably going to be the most technical part of the keynote. Not this one, though. This one is very straightforward, but we're going to get there. And we are even IIS. IIS saying application pools. But not only that. So where the passwords are in IIS. I love IIS. IIS is great when it's configured well. And um, basically, we've got over here, we can just get into advanced settings. And we can set up the identity of the application pool, like over here, so set. So password, confirm password. That password is stored in an encrypted way uh, by the service. That service is called Windows Process Activation Service in IIS. And that's the guy that is responsible for running and starting w3wp.exe with that credential. So obviously, this guy needs to know. He needs to know. So question is, where else we do have a password? So we're going to extract this one first. And then I would like to show you where else we are able to play with different types of um, passwords in the operating system. So this one is going to be in Windows, System32, INET SRV. And we've got a tool that is called AppCMD. Uh, a small personal comment uh, on the top of that. I don't know if you, of course, maybe you had a chance. You, I mean, you are developers as well, IT pros. So I'm sure you've been playing with this tool uh, before. I think it's the tool that has been designed in hell and brought to earth to uh, literally do a little like, revenge on humanity because it's far from being logical. So uh, I'll just type the command, OK? Uh, list up pool. Yeah, well, if you do list up CMD slash question mark, the list verb does not come out as the one that you can use. It only comes out when you do up CMD up pool slash question mark, then it will tell you that you can use list. So you're kind of like, not strange, right? So anyway, uh, text, uh, white parameter text. I mean, no comments. Uh, and then asterisk. Yeah, OK, great. So, um, and then we're going to specify, of course, the application pool name, so www.test.com text. And of course, if we do a little bit up there, then you will find out that Windows Process Activation Service is leveraging that value. So you, co you can always basically get into the password that is typed in somewhere. That's the rule number one in operating system. The only place, really, and let's just close that subject, where the password is stored in a form of a hash, it's some database or entity as though it That's it. Anything else, it's in a reversible form. Yeah? And it, it could be whatever, symmetric, asymmetric cryptography. It doesn't really matter. You can always get there. And that's a bit of a problem. Yeah? So this is the first one. Second, uh, when we go into the configuration, so it's not really IIS. It's in general the concept. Yeah? We've got centralized certificates. And I got over here centralized certificates configured. So you configure them this way. So you go over here, and I'm going to type in here password. Password, password. 
to find out where that password is actually stored, for that reason, it will be best to use Procmon. Yeah, so I'm going to actually do that. So I have here already configured the filter. That filter is category is right, which will actually allow me to monitor anything that is with the right operation in the operating system. And if I do OK over here, then basically what it does, it catches like the stuff that I want to. Um, so effectively, we can find out that exceptionally in IIS, while everything is stored in application host config, now this time in IIS, that stuff is stored in the registry. That's a bit unusual, yeah? But OK, that's fine. So here you've got a private key password where we can jump into and we can verify really of what is this about. So we can do jump to, let me just close this registry before, and we're going to stop, of course, that monitor, but private key password is there. It looks like base64. It smells like base64. Is it base64? Yeah. <laughs> so we can check. Uh, let me verify that. So basically, we're going to get to the details of it. But um, that value in general, so I got that in a PowerShell, is actually um, well stored in a registry, so we can import that from the registry. So let's do that into the past 64 variable. And then basically we can use the encoding for get string, so whatever we've got, system, system convert from the past 64, and we're going to um, convert that into the regular text. Yeah, so it's really a matter of encoding, yes, and we could have probably another hour about that, but in general it's not clear text in base 64. Yeah, that's the, that's the point. Now, what is it then? And this is actually uh, something that is used by the Windows Process Activation Service in IIS, encryption which is asymmetric, that is done by the RSA crypto service provider, as we can see over here. Yeah? Now, how do we know that? Well, because when we do a little bit more analysis in that area, yeah, so I will just stop it, Somewhere out there, so we can reset all the filters, some, but it's going to be a lot. So somewhere out there, you will see that we are actually, oh, that's actually pretty nice. So cryptography, defaults provider, et cetera, and you've got a RSA and AS crypto service provider. So basically, this is something that can tell us that most probably IS uses that type of provider. Yeah? So we can guess that, because there are not many of them, and we can technically get into the analysis, let's use this console uh, this time, uh, of, um, first of all, the decryption or encryption keys within the IIS. We're going to export them, and then we're going to use them to decrypt that value. Yeah? So let's do it. So uh, we're going to do it this way, or maybe let's just move uh, two levels down, uh, not this, here we go. Yeah, and we're going to do Microsoft.NET, Framework 64, version of Framework, and we are done. And then we're going to use ASP.NET underscore rec IIS with the option PX for exporting. And here, as parameters, we have to give three uh, things. First of all, uh, the container that IIS uses, and that's kind of awkward, because you, you love it or not, you need to learn this by heart. Why don't we just put the path to the key? No, IIS has the strange containers that we have to refer to, yeah? so we just need to know their names. And that container name is IIS was key. Now, you wonder, like, why like that? Well, Windows Activation Service has a P missing. Uh, someone was apparently really hungry, because uh, Actually, we call it Windows Process Activation Service, but as a shortcut, it's in the registry as well. It's seen as a WAS. Don't ask me why. I have no idea. I always find it extremely funny uh, because we're not activating Windows, obviously. It's just a, a little process out there, but maybe, you know, they've got some, some issues, whatever. So um, IS Windows Activation Service, uh, Process Activation Service key. And then we've got ctest1.xml. And then we do pry to export private keys. Yeah, that's one of the most forgotten uh, switches out there if you want to do a backup of the encryption keys within the IIS. So we did that. Now, test one is actually quite nice. Uh, let's just do notepad, test uh, one.xml. And then basically that looks like this. Yeah, so nothing really uh, breathtaking, but it's just a private key that we have over here. Yes. So this is something that is used by IIS, which we're going to leverage in the PowerShell in a moment. Yeah. So here we go. Test one XML. We are on the C drive. Lovely. So let's just copy that. Let's put it uh, in the context of the algorithm. That variable we have it. Now we're going to convert it into the byte array. 
Yeah, so the past 64 that we had, uh, let's just do it uh, to the binary. And why like that? Because that's the beauty of Windows, uh, beauty of Windows. And the reason why I'm doing this is because uh, in Windows, it depends on what kind of product group team, whatever, was writing that piece of code. You've got a little endian and big endian. Sometimes, basically, uh, you do writing from left to right, from left, from right to left, or whatever. And when you do a little bit of a research in cryptography, that's a bit hard to uh, find it. Yeah? So you always have to try that. So imagine 20 levels to go through, where you always have to verify if this time it's that direction or the opposite. Yeah? So this one is opposite, actually. So we have to revert it. And now we are good to go, because we can, we've got a value that has been decrypted. And that was basically the password that was out there, typed in as a private key for the certificates in the central certificate store. So yet another reason why sometimes passwords are pathetic in the operating system, yes? What's the mitigation for what we just shown? Uh, there isn't, yeah? So you kind of need to deal with that, but you need to manage of what runs on server. So anything like code integrity um, in Windows Server 2019, it has been a little bit improved, so it's coming. In general, we're talking device guard, um, we're talking app locker, or any other third party solutions for that. So you choose, um, but in general, controlling of what runs in operating system, plus privilege access management is what comes out to place. Okay, so let's move forward. So, so very, very briefly, we've got problem number two. So looking from the hacker's perspective, I was mentioning that I had a chance to sit at the one of the guy's desk. Totally, yes. So this is really a security culture that we need to build in an organization. Question is, of course, what may happen when we do that? So A, information can be stolen. We don't need to be users for that. But the second part, it can be that someone may inject something. And the question is, what that will be? And when, what I would like to show you, it's a very simple and short demonstration, which is technically covering in our, our keynote the next point as well, which is related with that type of a device. Yeah? So this is a pen drive, which you might uh, already play with it. It's a good, by the way, way to teach your kids how to do a basic programming. And that's called a uh, rubber ducky. Yeah. So this is a rubber ducky from the Hack5, My Shopify, etc. I'm not advertising it. It's one of the security things that we have out there. Question is, what are the statistics uh, where we actually drop it on the floor at the customer side that people take it and they plug it in? We did our own stats because we like to do that. And, um, and before I show you, of course, how it works. So these are two things related with each other. So USB stick up. Then let's have a look. 60% of people, when they find it, yeah, and it doesn't have a company logo on it, they plug it in. 90% do it when then there is a company logo. Yeah? So it's like a success ratio is like super high. Yeah? Of course, if you did not lock the USB stick. Now, the bad news is that here you can block the storage USB stick within the group policy, etc. But in here, you can regenerate the ID and pretend to be a mouse by the ID, device ID, hardware ID. So this is also quite, quite nice. So in general, it's a bit of a problem. But once we do have implementation of blocking the storage devices that are unknown, we are raising the bar, and it's already a great approach in cybersecurity. So the question is, of course, how does it work? And I'm just going to show you part of it, yes? Uh, I mean, because, I mean, whole scenario, it, we could really invent, and it's, it can be as deep as our imagination, but I just need you to see one thing. So this is the concept. This particular pen drive, let me stick it in. Uh, here we go. And uh, yeah, the focus is out there in the machine. So let's see. It works with a seven and a half second of a delay, and it acts like a keyboard, because indeed it has a keyboard chipset. So hopefully it will all work fine. Let's see, it may or may not. Uh, so let's find out. For some reason, I can see that it's not acting as it's supposed to, but I'm sure it will. So let me just plug it in, in a different port for some reason. Yeah, it should be fine. It's just that, here we go. Huh? Yeah, it should be, it should be okay. Um, I mean, in the worst case, uh, I'll show you how, it's, how it looks inside, but this is the, this is the setup. For, for some reason, it does not... Yeah, no, this is me, by the way. It's not this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To be, uh, yeah, here we go. Um, let's see. I don't know. Maybe there's some food inside. <laughs> <laughs> so since I always carry it in my backpack, I mean, you never know. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but let's see. Um, let's, let's try for the first time. And um, in the worst case, I got a, I got a picture, so I'll show you the whole concept. But what it does, it starts typing, yeah? 
So I will change the focus on my machine, uh, and let's see um, if it actually works in, oh, yeah, something got clicked. So it's, there is a chance, there is a chance, okay. So let's find out. For the last time, I will see if it works in my box. Uh, so here you will not see anything for the moment. I will see if it actually triggers. Uh, <laughs> I don't have access to the internet in this machine, that's why it uh, says so, yeah? Okay, so well, that's interesting. For some reason, it does not recognize it, uh, which is actually quite awkward because it pretty much always works, but all the time works. But in general, let's dig in and then I will get back to it, yeah? So it looks like this, yeah? So inside, inside this little guy, you've got like a chipset that is actually a keyboard chipset, yeah? So when once we open it, then basically we're able to see um, the small micro SD card, which is uh, on the left side of the picture. And this is the place where you actually do coding, yeah? So in general, this is one of the nicest ways of how you are able to perform some activities uh, through this, this little device out there. So um, I will open it and I will try once again, because uh, it might be that that micro SD card was not plugged in uh, well. Uh, could be an option too, because my friend was actually playing with it. Uh, so uh, he was like, yeah, playing. Uh, it's kind of dangerous uh, since it was my friend, so I don't know what could be the situation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can see that it does not react. So yeah, apparently something must have happened. But anyway, uh, so um, this is in general the, the ways of how you can get the code inside, yeah? It should be blinking in green, yeah. So, uh, but it's not blinking. So it could be that it does not see it. It's not powered or something. I don't know. Yeah. So this is this is the case. But what's my point over here? My point is that whitelisting could definitely solve it. Even though we've got blocking or not that particular access uh, to the uh, certain type of uh, devices, we still need to run the code. And that code is a problem right now. We do have, for example, in our team. Uh, well, the, the, the very specific type of a malware written in PowerShell. So it's actually uh, ransomware written in PowerShell for the test for the education purposes. So question is, do we have that allowed? Yeah? And uh, this is one of, the, one of the trends that are uh, out there to implement that kind of, uh, that kind of uh, solutions. Now, the funny part, I don't know, guys, if you heard of uh, something that is called LOLBINS or LOLBAS, L-O-L-B-A-S. If you didn't, then definitely check it out, because this is a list. It's nothing like breathtaking, but it's in general a list on the GitHub of things that are operating system tools that are allowing you to download malicious code or execute malicious code. So for example, certutil or msconfig uh, are the ones that are allowing you to download, for example, malware from whatever web, yeah? because certutil with the URL switch allows you to fetch a CRL list, so why not a zip file, right? So this is exactly the situation. So verify those because we've never seen really the whitelisting solution implemented well. Um, and that is because uh, people forgot about blocking things like msconfig, certutil, etc. Yeah. So so verify verify that. Now moving forward, fish biting. So any type of phishing activities that we have right now, question is of course. How do we react to those? Do we have, for example, uh, different types of solutions like Office 365 has uh, advanced threat protection or any other solutions that are allowing us to verify by reputation uh, whenever we click on the link before that it's going through the machine learning process and we've got uh, um, something that is called uh, intelligent threat detection. So relying on the machine learning and AI on the vendors that you pay to, uh, then someone is able to verify your link. Unfortunately, this is the situation that we are getting to because uh, I like to do things by myself, but right now we are giving the whole security into vendor to, we, that, to which we subscribe to. And that's kind of the direction that we are moving forward because the threats, they become so advanced that at the end, it's kind of hard to spot that, um, that this is actually a good or bad software. And I would like to show you that in a moment. This is one of our emails that, uh, one of the emails that our customer got. I changed my email, uh, changed the email to mine. And this was literally a situation where someone got an email, hey, someone left you a voice message on a Dropbox. Yeah, I mean, it's obviously the way how we communicate. Um, unfortunately, this person knew exactly who to target. So that was a, our customer literally calling me and he was like, hey, Paula, uh, we've got to run somewhere right now. What am I supposed to do? And one of the things I recommended is that, uh, well, I, I know how their infrastructure looks like, uh, is, uh, and they don't have any kind of a process tracking or anything like that, to dig in into prefetch. 
Yeah, so prefetch is something that we all have. And C Windows prefetch or prefetcher service uh, contains the history of anything that we've been running. And that is also a nice way to verify what actually happened if you want to do a little bit of forensics after the whole situation. So I'll show you this in a moment. Now, before we get there, a little bit of a warming up activity. Uh, this is an email that I have got uh, when I was basically um, coming back from, um, I was in Huntsville in Alabama, very nice place by the way, and I dropped the car, and I rented the car by the way from Avis, and I dropped it, and just after that I'm giving this email. I'm, I'm getting this email, yeah? So it says, hey, please find the attached the requested rental receipt. Is it spam or not? There is the context, the most important part for, for fishers, for spammers. There is one actually, check. Hmm? Thank you, thank you, thank you for noticing this, yes? Requested, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm that picky too. And I didn't request anything, I'm like, hey, I didn't request that, why are, why are you sending this to me, yeah? Now, if you are a bit of a pedant person, you will notice that there's more spaces in the title than there's supposed to be. That's not how we write emails to customers. Um, also, P in please is smaller. I don't like that. And also, uh, and this is easy to see, the Roy Morrison has no space after N uh, before pipe. That's awkward too. And who the hell is joint resolution specialist? I don't know, but I want that position, yes? It's really funny. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what is this? So. If we do have a look in the Avis budget group, uh, I've never heard of any group, but that's okay, maybe my fault. But logo, we, we cannot see it on a projector now, but it's a little blurred. So it has, it's compressed, yeah? So that's also not very good to attach an email. So anything really stinked about this, including that name of the PDF-2, meaning it's a two-pager, or what is it? So what I did, I took it later, uh, and I analyzed it, and that is something that contained JavaScript, malicious JavaScript. So funny that it was actually related with the fact that I was dropping a car. So I called Avis, and as you can imagine, oh, you are not renting a car. Oh, yeah, I'm like, no, I want to talk to your IT department because you are someone inside, like, sending out all these emails. Forget it, yes? Yeah? So I was like, okay, the world's going to be gone anyway. So um, I'm not worried about fixing that problem. But that was actually a context that I had. So someone from the inside of the company was doing that just after I dropped the car. So uh, interesting, interesting situation. Okay, guys, so what are we going to do? Technically, question is, whenever we run some piece of code, question is, how does it run? That's the first thing. What it can do, that's the second thing. And what I would like to show you is the situation where we're going to be getting into the, this situation if we can get access to the someone's secret. So you don't need to be a, an admin to do that kind of operation, of course, that I will show you. But what I would like to pinpoint here is very important thing that you all definitely need to know. Every single time, this is easy, by the way, for now. We're going to get deeper in a second. Every single time we store the password somewhere in a browser, in Outlook, private keys, uh, name it, yeah? Um, integrated key pass Windows logon or something like that. But in general, password for Facebook, LinkedIn, stored in a browser, Outlook, these are typical places for storing secrets in our operating system. We are dealing with Data Protection API. And this is an example. So Chrome Pass, it's an app that you can download from Nearsoft, another rocket science, and it says one important thing, and it's a good lesson, that every single app that you guys run, every single app uh, that you run as yourself, has or can have access to any secrets that you stored. Yeah? So whatever you run, portable apps, name it, yeah? it, ha it can have access to the secrets that, that, you, that, that, you, you, that you got. And it could be digitally signed. We don't care about that. Yeah, uh, not, not, not um, in the current times. So question is how um, and is or are these secrets safe? Well, if you run the apps that you don't know or whatever they come from, for example, my favorite example for that is actually 7-Zip because we all use it, but who knows the author? Do you know this guy in person? I know his name. Yeah, so yeah, that's my point. So we all run it and sometimes we run it on a server. And don't get me wrong, it's digitally signed. Oh, great. Yeah, so imagine the environment he's writing in this app. I don't know, somewhere in a basement eating pizza. He's like, ah, today I'm going to be a bad 7 zip developer. Push. And then see, he submits the update, and then everybody gets an update, and then we get all these famous stories that, uh, like it was with the CC Cleaner uh, some time ago, that we all install app that is digitally signed, but it contains malware. So that's the, that's a perfect situation for him. 
if I'll be him, um, I'll, I'll, I don't know if I'll do it. Uh, if I'll be like, you know, 80 years old at the end when you're like maybe a little grumpy, yes, then it'll be like, I hate this word anyway, push. And then everybody is like <laughs> using 7-zip is like having a problem, yeah? Uh, anyway, um, that's kind of my point over here. So let's find out if these secrets are secure. So if someone steals your laptop or if someone gets access to your profile, because this is where they are stored, by the way, uh, are we able to get access to those? So let's find out. So first of all, this is clear that if I run Chrome Pass, so any other app, then any other app has access to whatever I saved in Chrome and any other app too. Not necessarily Chrome is a victim here, but in this example it is. So we're going to lock this desktop and then I'm going to log on with the password password uh, so that you can see that I can, right? So it's a p at ssw0rd, enter, I'm logging on. And this is a domain user, I'm connected to the domain, domain controller is up, so anything is fine. So what we will do right now is, we're going to reboot this computer, uh, so let's do restart. And we're going to restart it from the uh, window installation media, and there is a reason why I'm doing it. We could do it online or offline, doesn't matter, but I want to have this scenario super clear, so that what we are actually doing over here. So what we're going to do is, we're going to change Something that in Windows we like to call cache credentials, while they are not credentials, actually. They, this is a cache log on data. Our team has reverse engineered those. And you cannot log on with those. You can only compare with those. So basically, I'm going to change the cache log on data in the registry of the operating system so that I can log on with a different password, because when I type it in, that will be compared with whatever we've got in the registry. All right? So that's, that's the flow out there. So um, then we will see one thing, that our secrets in the operating system, that they are actually dependent on a couple of things. And my question would be, how would you feel about that? Yeah? So let's dig in. So first, we are changing the cache log on data because our secrets are actually dependent on the password's hash. So let's do troubleshoot, advanced options, because common prompt is obviously an advanced option, yeah? Uh, let's move uh, further. Um, here we go. And uh, let's get into CQ tools, and let's go into Kiwi Secure Edition. So this is the Mimikatz that I'm sure you guys might be familiar with, but this is our Secure Edition, is the one that is actually not recognized by antivirus of the classic generation. So for example, Sophos, I mean, I'm just going to use the names because it's the fact. So Sophos, CrowStrike, uh, and the Windows Defender ATP are the ones that are actually recognizing it because they are recognizing it based on the machine learning. Uh, all the other companies are getting there, absolutely, nothing wrong about them. But the classic type of an antivirus, so whatever you use, if you use whatever, McAfee, regular Defender, uh, Note, name it, they are not recognizing that type of mimicats. OK, so what we're going to do, let's say dump, cache, and then we're going to do the windows. I have to type it, unfortunately, system32 config uh, system. And then we're going to do the windows, system32 config security. Why these two? Because system contains a boot key. That's like the most important part that is responsible for all the system secrets. Um, so service accounts, passwords, um, cache log on data, uh, IIS in general, so the secrets of ELSAS, so the secrets folder as well, they are all dependent on the boot key that is in the system hive, which consists, by the way, of a bunch of uh, class names um, from the LSA, uh, and it's exportable in a super easy way. Now, security contains cache log on data. Yeah? And then, basically, we do slash Kiwi, enter, and that overrides our cache log on data. Now, to make the whole scenario super nice, we need to do one more thing. If we're going to be logging on with the cache log on data, so independently from the domain, I have to disconnect from the network so that we actually log on with the cache log on data. Fine, fine, fine. Done. And we can do continue to boot up to Windows 10. Now, I'll try to log on with the password that I used before, because if I don't have an access to the domain, it should be cached. So cache log on data. Uh, but effectively, uh, I should, I'm not supposed to be able to do that because I overwritten that value in the registry, plus there is no communication to the network or with the network. Here we go. So we go this, password, enter. It says it's incorrect, yes? And now I type in the new password, which has been generated by the tool, yeah? Mimikatz, enter, and I'm logging on. And this is a domain account. It's not a local account, yeah? Now, what's the problem here? The problem is with accountability. So you will see in a moment that even though 
I am accessing a domain account like that, then if we get into our app, once again, Chrome Pass, bing, bing, see? Uh, we don't, we, are, we, we just wait for it. Because what's happening, uh, we are decrypting the master keys in the operating system. I will explain it in a picture in a second. But we can't do it because we are doing it with the current passwords hash. Yeah? So we are trying one by one, but effectively, that's not working. Yeah, because it's empty password over here. So let's get, get into the introduction uh, of what the Data Protection API is about. And then basically, uh, I'm going to explain that on the, on the small picture. So I'm going to write it. And then uh, you will see how bad I am in uh, graphs. Yeah? Local user, domain user, yeah? the live picture. So what are we talking about here? It's a data protection API explained. So local user secrets are protected in the following way. We've got a user, user logs on. On the top of that, we are calculating MD4. So let's just type it, MD4. We're comparing with the SAM database. Check. Yeah. And then the second stage is, on the top of that, we are calculating SHUA1. And that SHUA1 is responsible for encrypting secrets. Technically, master keys that encrypt secrets. There's a one level in between. Now, why SHUA1? Well, because this is not prone to the offline access. If I grab into some, someone's SAM database, there is an MD4. So if it was protected with MD4, I will be able to get access to secrets immediately. But the point is that if you want to get access to secrets, first you need to crack MD4s, then you need to calculate SHUA1, then you get access to secrets. So it's okay. Yeah? We could complain on SHUA1, but it's actually okay. So domain user, it's a little bit more interesting. So we've got, we're logging on. We've got, of course, MD4. That is compared with NTDS.dit within the logon process, putting in a very short word. And after that, MD4 is actually used to protect the user's master keys that protect secrets. Yeah? Now, there's a master key one, but there's also master key two. And this is why we are here today, because that master key two, it's something that is stored in everybody's profiles while the private key corresponding to the public key that we are talking about is stored in a domain controller's memory. Now, the problem is that every single machine and every single user's profile in the environment is actually, and let me show you uh, this one in a moment, not this machine, but we need our Windows 10 over here, this one. It is actually stored in here. So we do percent up data percent bank. So we've got Microsoft, We've got um, Protect, yeah, we've got this over here. And when we get into the details, this BK Secure, uh, it's okay, BK Secure is actually the one that is a public key that is encrypting everybody's secrets in that domain. And is it differ, different from all of you? If we're all working in the same company, we would all have the same one public key encrypting our secrets. So imagine if someone gets access to the private key, this person gets access to all of our secrets that we have stored in Windows. And let's do it, yeah? So, uh, <laughs> so basically, that works in the following way. And um, here we go. So here we're going to get into the DC. And in that DC, uh, let's get into tools, data tools, here we go. And then we're going to get into the toolkit. I've got here the tool that we've written, which is called CQ Elsa Secrets Dumper. I'm absolutely not bragging about it, but our team is the first, and as far as I know, the only team that fully reverse engineered the whole crypto platform in Windows. We've got over 40 tools around it for KeePass, LastPass, uh, RDP Connections Manager, call it, yeah? Um, and here we do specify a file, exported PFX, fantastic. And exported PFX, we're going to import. Enter, enter. The password is small letters secure, as our company name. Next, 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 whatever. And if we do to cert mgr.msc, mgr.msc, here we go, perfect. Then we go to personal certificates, and this is how that certificate looks like. Yeah. So what's the characteristic of it? Well, it's quite interesting, because it's issued to nobody by nobody. Now. I'm keeping this on purpose here, valid from 2012 to 2013, because it's, it has been generated at the moment you actually set up your domain. So if your domain was out there in a company in 2003, and you migrated 
by without destroying a domain, so you just change the domain controller systems versions or whatever, functional level, whatever, then that key stays the same. So the bad news is that if you care about security, then basically this is a 2048-bit key. So if you had a domain that was set up, let's say, 2003, so 15 years ago, then that has been already cracked for sure. Yeah, it's also leveraging SHA-1, which you guys may not like, because in that area, it's so-so. So the question is, how can we leverage that private key out there? So let me show you that. So here, we're coming back to the Windows 10 right now. We are opening the console as a regular user. I'm not even an admin ho over here, by the way, just to show you. Um, well, no, not this is a bad idea to show, but we can do that, for example. Yes, so just one of the ways. Yeah, so it asks me to provide credentials. Now, here, um, what we're going to do, first of all, we will, in order to get access to these secrets, we need to uh, generate the user's password hash, the current user's password hash, um, which is um, of the Mimikatz. Because Data Protection API works this way that things always have to be encrypted through the API. We are getting access to that. Yeah. So then we do uh, CQ uh, hash calc Mimikatz one. Uh, no, not the capital. Let's just do that. Here we go. Mimikatz one, and this is our password hash. Okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to decrypt the master key that is responsible for encrypting that secret with the private key of the domain that we just extracted, exported from the DC, and encrypt it back with that particular password hash. Let's see if it works. So we're going to do it like this, CQ, master key AD, this is our tool, uh, of course, sharing all the tools um, also in, in our blog, uh, if, you, if you would like to check. We've got PFX, and we specify exported PFX. We specify here new hash, and then we paste it, and then file. And that's a bit of a challenge, because we need to find out which of these is responsible for must being a master key to get access to our secrets. And I know that this is this one. And you can read that if you put in the hex editor Chrome data, Chrome literally is called actually data, and it's called also cookies from the user's profile, from the local profile. If you drop it, you're going to see the identifier of the key that is responsible for working on a data protection API blob. So right click, copy as path. Here we go. File done. Perfect. The next thing we will need to do is to change the attributes of the system and hidden. But before we do that, there is a new key created. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to rename this guy. And good. OK. And then AD modified, we're going to rename it into the original one, Yeah. so that we got it this way. Bang. Now the icon is white, so we have to work on it a little bit too by setting up that um, attribute, so system and hidden. Then we are done, so we change that attribute um, right now. And this guy being empty, right now it's filled up with password, which confirms one thing over here, is that every single secret that you guys maintain within your domain environment can be grabbed by anybody who has access to the domain controllers slash domain admins credentials. Yet another reason, by the way, quite serious, I would say, for implementing the privilege access management in our organizations and also making sure that nobody executes anything that we don't know on a domain controller, which we all know it's important because we've been bragging about it for a whole time, but that is actually quite a serious reason that impacts our privacy at the end. So if you have a bad domain admin or someone manages to get access out there, well, is this a reason to wipe the domain? Uh, I don't know. It's our customers have been dealing with these problems, whoever has been hacked out there. But yes, yet it's another reason for having that kind of security in place. So just to sum up of what we said before we move forward, is that our secrets in the organization are as safe as our, our passwords are, because it depends on our passwords, as our backup of the domain is, as our domain admin's imagination is. Yes, this is pretty much the, the situation. OK, two more things. Um, reckless abandon means device encryption or situations where the device fails. 
So incident response plan, just to mention, yes? Yeah? So in general, when something fails, then we need to know what to do. One of the funniest parts on our customer side was basically that customers have a problem with reacting to the incidents. So they call us, for example, and they're like, okay, what we are supposed to do, fine. We're like, take that tools, take that drive, that amount of the drive space and perform a dump, collect the evidence. And they're like, oh, I don't have a drive that has whatever, 250 gigs. And okay, well, let me give you, give me a second. I have to wipe that stuff from the drive. So this is technically a funny situation because you have to act fast. While lots of customers that we are dealing with, they didn't have really the pile of a free space drives to collect and gather the information on them while we have an incident. Funny, funny and prosaic situation. The tools, yes, the skill set is there, but the empty space isn't. Yes, so they have to wait until someone wipes it and prepares the drive so that we can collect the evidence. Oh. So another part, it's connecting to different types of networks and in general the threat protection. So what can happen? So machine learning for the threat protection is something that is a very nice trend right now. Windows Defender ATP that I was mentioning discovers threats that are unknown. And this is really the future of cybersecurity. And in 2019, we should definitely look into those kind of solutions. There's lots of companies that started to do the research in that matter. And whenever the threat is unknown, they can still, by correlation and knowing the different types of boundaries, uh, recognize the threat. So just to have a look, um, because this is what's, what's coming out there. And finalizing, sometimes we are a little bit too social. We are sharing lots of different types of information out there in social media. But at the end, um, what is important is that that social part can also become a problem in our company. Uh, that's why it's so important to talk security to our employees, to make sure that they are part of the cybersecurity or in general security awareness programs, because that is becoming a quite advanced situation. While if we don't have a coverage in technology, if we don't have a, let's say, machine learning based detection, you, we still have to rely a little bit on people in discovery of a different types of situations uh, in, our in our environment. So summing up why human factor is so important. If you remind yourself the story that I was sharing at the very beginning within the keynote, that was just a pure humanic thing. And the reason why it's important is because of three reasons, actually. S security is both reality and feeling, or should be, yes? If I don't like this email, if it's far from the context, if, an, if I am not expecting package from DHL, I'm not opening this email. Yeah? Now, what we are dealing with, actually, it's a phishing that is written by humans to humans in the national language um, on purpose. Um, so, so it has no context very often. So it's a little bit more difficult to, to spot that. That's why having solutions that can help us to automate that uh, on the email side, which is actually one of the main points of entry for malware, makes sense. Not every attacker is that smart. Maybe that's not very nice to say that. But in general, the context very often is missing. And uh, that is something that kind of defends us. But at the end, of course, human factor makes sense because we can always take a picture of a document that has been um, protected, encrypted, etc. So I'm leaving you guys with two important slides at the end. Quick look at the sources of how to build a cybersecurity strategy in the organization. This is a little boring, don't get me wrong, because um, cybersecurity is a very interesting subject and it's very custom per organization. That's why a little bit of an extension, which is a cybersecurity framework. Yes, and you are definitely getting this slide, so just enjoy. But in general, these are mentioned uh, areas where cybersecurity can be implemented. And it's not only technology, it's also human resources. How do we actually hire a domain admin? Because you are just hiring a person that's going to have access to lots of different types of information. And uh, this, is, this is, in general, the summary of all these different types of challenging things that in our team's opinion, in my opinion, is going to happen in 2019. We're going to pay more attention to cybersecurity and treat it in a little bit more organized way. So best practices, understanding. So hopefully in this a little technical keynote, you could see how we're able to extract secrets, how we're able to get access to information. Um, one of the interesting situations that are happening right now in Windows Server 2019 and Windows 10, it's a credential guard mitigating past the hash, but we sometimes tend to forget that there is a privilege in the operating system that is called to impersonate a client after authentication. So I don't need someone's credential. It's enough that I have a session established 
and I have Protoss Hacker, for example, right click miscellaneous run as this user, and then you're becoming a domain admin. While everybody's talking that, oh, credentials right now will not be in a memory, that's great, but session will be. It's still a problem. So that's why it's so important to make sure that we are not allowing to run the code that we don't know. And that's really what is mitigating the biggest amount of security problems out there. Additional resources, a little bit of a newspapers out there that we follow to get the news. Um, but it's of course more, but these are the most popular ones. And of course, if you want to grab yourself a little bit more knowledge, uh, uh, we are running with our team a quiz. No registration is free, etc. And uh, it's a little bit, we think it's a little hardcore because the average amount of responses, uh, positive responses is 14 out of 25 questions uh, on a couple of thousand people. Actually, it was over 14,000 people that already answered. So it's a quite a nice average on security. We're very disappointed. So uh, that's why uh, hopefully after this keynote, it's going to be a higher average. Thank you so much, guys. If you want more information, uh, we share always information for free on our blog because we like security. And uh, hopefully see you on the coffee break. I'll be here after the that block of session finishes. So if you have any questions, I'm super happy to have uh, tea or coffee or whatever you have out there uh, with you. So thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you.